Okay, so welcome to our first uh, video on uh, variants, what they are, um, why we should be interested in uh, what a variant is and why they keep making the news. Essentially, a variant is a perfectly normal part of biological evolution. Life changes, life adapts, mutations happen, and biological entities, I'm not going to say living organisms because viruses mm, kind of aren't, um, they do change, okay? So, uh, first thing to talk about is right the idea of what we mean by a variant, okay? So, it's essentially a step in evolution of, of viruses. So, a mutation will occur which changes one base in the RNA of the virus, that's a, a relative of DNA, um, which basically could make them more able to spread, okay, and make them more infectious. Now, there will be mutations happening all the time, because uh, viral replication is an extremely messy and inaccurate process. However, we just wouldn't notice. We just don't notice those variants, because they either die immediately or they don't actually give the virus any benefit whatsoever, okay? And maybe someone doing a, a DNA or RNA sequencing project, which the UK is very, very good at, would notice this, but they wouldn't be of any interest at all, okay? Over time, though, viruses will evolve to be more infectious, but also less lethal. They'll evolve to, to give fewer symptoms. Reason for this is from a virus's point of view, what, what's the advantage in killing your host, right? For the successful propagation of a virus, it wants to be perhaps as infectious as possible, but also not noticeable, so that the host is still wandering around in the population, spreading it about the place. If it kills the host, that is not a good survival strategy for the virus. So actually these variants, this increase in infectiousness, and actually maybe a future decrease in pathogenicity and decrease in, in, in lethalness, is a normal part of, um, of a virus's life cycle. Obviously this is a new virus, it's made a jump into humans only about a year and a bit ago, right? So it's obviously on that trajectory of working its way towards being just one of the normal viruses that we have in our bodies all the time. Because if you count them up, and there's a lot of recent research going into this, human virology of course, even before the pandemic, we've got about third, uh, 380 trillion virus particles in you as an average normally. There are tens and tens of types, and obviously that uh, numbers of types of viruses that live routinely in you is rapidly increasing as we discover more and more. And it's got a name. It's called the human virome, right? Like a genome or a proteome or a microbiome. This is called the human virome. And again, it's perfectly normal, okay? So the problem comes in terms of reporting this, I think, where we start to talk about antigens and antibodies uh, sort of in a really, really simplistic way. So when you see pictures on the news of the COVID, um, of the COVID virus, you're probably aware that it's the spike protein. It's the, the protein that sticks out of the, of the virus. That is the thing that is altering and that's the thing that allows it to get into your cells and that's the thing that undergoes mutations, okay? So here I've drawn you a kind of my first Tomy's early learning center diagram of the kind of thing you might see on a BBC news report or, or other media outlet, right? So they simplify down the spike protein to just these sort of triangle shapes, like it's a sort of toddler's um, putting shapes in boxes. And that's fine for understanding the broad, broad processes. But when you come to think about what these variations mean, we've got to go a lot smaller, right? We've got to go a lot, lot smaller. So here, right, you can see on my backdrop picture is a little bit more detail, okay, in terms of these 3D structures. Now, these 3D structures are all made of proteins, okay, and proteins are made of amino acids. And it's the RNA, in this case, the DNA in you, that codes for the uh, the order of those amino acids. And when we say a variant, something's changed in that RNA, which then changes the order of the amino acids, right, which then changes the shape of the protein. Okay. Now, whether that shape change is important or not is another question. Okay. So if we look in a little bit more detail, there are actually a number of proteins sticking out of COVID-19. The E protein, the M protein, the S protein. It's the S protein that we're actually interested in, the so-called spike protein. Because to the virus, that's its kind of key to get into your cell. Right? But for our purposes, it's what our immune system uses to recognize this as an invader. Okay, that's how the immune system works. It looks on shape, right? And it makes antibodies that are specific to specific 3D shapes. And again, if we get to antibodies, right, in a moment, you'll see that we always show the antibody binding on to this S protein, which is true. 
but there's a little more nuance to it than that, okay? So if we go even further in on the spike protein, we'll actually see it's not just a triangle or just a blob. It's a series of amino acid chains and sugars. These are these sort of uh, little blue blobs here. So it's a glycoprotein type arrangement that are kind of wrapped around each other to form this overall 3D shape. Now, each of those strands, if we pick this yellow one here, each of these strands will be made of tons and tons and loads and loads and loads of amino acids. And our mutation, which would generate our new variant, might change one amino acid. And that could be completely irrelevant. Just one amino acid to another amino acid makes no difference to the shape, no difference to the infectiousness whatsoever, no difference to, to your body's ability to uh, bind on to that particular antibody. Because it might be that the, uh, the antibody binds on to a shape way over on the other side. So it makes no difference at all to your immune response or the vaccines or anything like that. And that's probably the most likely thing that's going to happen, okay? Now, if we look at the antibodies themselves, again, in media reports that are quite quick, we tend to simplify them to these Y-shaped chemicals. And they are, but that's kind of Toby's early learning center, my first antibody, right? Even at A level, we simplify, right? We, we give this diagram, which shows there's four protein chains attached together, and we show that up at the top there, they're on the sort of points of the Y, that's where they bind on to, they have a specific complementary shape, like a uh, sort of the, the, the lock for a key, and they bind on to those S, uh, those S proteins, okay, or at least a part of those S proteins. And they bind on there, and that activates the immune system and in, in, immobilizes them and stops them being very effective. Okay, so our antigen binding site's up the top there, and then we've got down at the bottom there, we've got a, a, so down at the end there, we've got a bit that activates other parts of the immune system. Okay, but again, if we looked in, in even more detail, right, the shape is really specific. If you have a look at this diagram down here, you can see each of these little blobs, that's an amino acid. And if the virus is protein, one of those amino acids has changed, which changes the overall 3D shape of that spike protein, it might be that the shape on the end here, the so-called antigen binding site, doesn't fit anymore. Okay, And that's what people are worried about. That is what would mean that our um, our vaccines, right, that obviously are training our immune system to make a certain type of antibody, those antibodies would no longer fit onto the, uh, onto the spike protein if the spike protein has changed. Okay, that's what we're worried about. However, if we line them up next to each other, you can see it's not binary, right? It's not a, a simple case of this antibody fits perfectly over this um, perfect, perfectly over this uh, protein, and it either does or it doesn't fit. Okay, it's not a one or the other. Probably a, a change in an amino acid would have no effect whatsoever at all. Right, that's the most likely thing. If it was going, if it were to have an effect it would probably be quite a small one. It might have reduced the effectiveness of these, uh, these particular antibodies by a percentage or three or five or 10, okay? It doesn't mean that the antibodies are completely useless and it doesn't mean that therefore the vaccines are completely useless, right? And you get a lot of this in the media going, will this render our vaccines completely useless? And the answer is no. It might knock a few percentage off the effectiveness, but then we get a new vaccine. We keep manufacturing them like we do with the flu vaccine every year, okay, to make slightly more honed, more refined um, antibodies just for that particular strain, okay. So my, my point here is not to worry too much about new strains and new variations. Yes, we need to keep an eye on them. Yes, we need to be aware for future vaccine development, but it's not like the, the vaccines are going to become go from fully 100% useful to 0% useful overnight okay and while yes some of them may become more infectious right and they may spread around in fact the kent variant is now the dominant variant in the country and that is worrying right again the same sort of treatments and the same sort of vaccines are still going to be very very useful in, in stopping them because the changes are on a kind of sliding scale right it's not binary it's not all or nothing so as i say the point of this little video goes as follows here right it, which is that viruses do change over time okay um simplified structures on the media uh, and, and in, in the public discourse give us this idea that it could be one thing or the other right they're actually really, really complicated structures and changes can be minor and have no effect whatsoever. Small changes, as we say, are unlikely to make much of a difference, although they might, but that difference will not be binary. It won't be all or nothing, okay? Uh, and mutations that do make a difference, 
can be adapted to. In fact, uh, Oxford, uh, the same labs that manufactured the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, are already manufacturing new updates on the vaccinations for new variants. Okay, But as we can see, and we're going to come to in a later video, the vaccines are working incredibly well, new data suggests, even on um, the, the variants that are currently in the UK. But what will happen in the future? We don't know. But I can assure you, it won't be as dramatic as some of the reporting makes it out to be. Okay? Right. Thanks very much, and I'll see you for the next chapter soon. Bye-bye.